Good morning, everyone from New York. My name is Salman Ravala. I am uh, managing this panel and I am uh, proud to moderate today's important topic on overcoming the endemic global inequalities. Uh, by way of background, I am an attorney. I practice commercial litigation and employment litigation. And a lot of what I see is, is perhaps addressed uh, in some ways, shape or form in the topic that we're covering today. The management of COVID-19 is engulfing globally severe inequalities. There are gender and diversity crises, unemployment in general, yet overemployment of children, and the list seems endless. How should we begin to tackle wealth, racial and gender issues? And what are the initial steps needed to make this happen? With us today is a group of speakers from all around the world. We have Fabrice Udart, based in New York City. We have Kirti Jayakumar, who is the founder of the Gender Security Project in Chennai, India. And we have Nikhil Kumar with Grid News from the United States. Why don't we start with our first speaker, Fabrice Udart from New York City, if you could please talk to us a little bit about this topic. Uh, but first, tell us um, what you do, what organization you're with, and what your connection is to the topic. Well, Salman, first of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, hosting this panel. My, uh, my background is that I work at the World Bank, uh, the United Nations, and now I'm with a think tank in, uh, in New York City. You know, I was always inter interested when I was at the World Bank in the, the, the connection between violation of, of human rights and poverty and inequalities. And, you know, the bank was not always super interested by this topic. You know, at the beginning, the thinking was a lot. If you increase GDP, everybody is going to benefit from it. There is no need to look at any particular group. Um, now, I have to give a disclaimer. I, you know, I'm myself, I'm gay. I have been working a lot on the, on the rights of LGBTQ plus people. So my experience is to try to get that specific community to benefit from the fruits of development. But in fact, I think it applies to a lot of other community. And, and you know, to start the discussion, I would say that first, I don't believe in that trickle down theory, right? I don't believe that when GDP increase, everybody benefits from it. In fact, what I've, what I've observed during my 14 years at the bank, which is not a huge time, but, but you know, I covered many regions of the world. What I observed is that very often when there is poverty or when there is uh, inequalities in, uh, in distribution of wealth, there, is violation, there are violations of human rights. And that in a way, uh, one way to address it is to push uh, the human rights agenda. Uh, today it's difficult because, as you know, there has been a bit of a dismantling of the human rights agenda as being an, an imperialist agenda pushed uh, by the United States, and that is not valid in in uh, in today's um, in today's world. And so, one thing that I've been working on a lot is getting the private sector companies to say that they stand for human rights and they are interested in a more equal and stable world. And, uh, and sometimes it's difficult, you know, as you know, CEOs are being asked all the time to weigh on social mm -hmm. issues and so on. Uh, there's been an uphill battle. But, but so to, to, to summarize, you know, my thoughts is that first of all, we have to pay particular attention to communities that are not benefiting from economic growth. And then I would say that my second thought is that if governments are not going to champion the human rights agenda, then we should, we should tap in the private sector so that they say, look, we are standing for a more equal world. Thank you. Uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about what your framework has been. And I hear that it's the human rights framework, uh, which, which makes sense here. Uh, if governments fail, we must address this topic to private companies. But is it that easy, though? Are private companies also perhaps in a similar board or has, has your response from these private companies been the same as governments, or at least I would hope not? Well, is you it know, as easy as you make it? That's a very good, that's a very good question. You know, I, 
in a way, it's a bit of a pragmatist approach. You know, when I was at the United Nations in the office of the High Commissioner, they hated me because I was engaging the private sector. And they, was all, they were always telling, well, look, those companies are dirty. Uh, you know, why do you want to associate with them? And in a way, the, the pragmatic approach is that they have huge impact. You know, if you think about Amazon, if you think about Google, in a way, they're, they're shaping um, humankind. And so not engaging them is extremely risky. Uh, one thing that is working to our advantage is that they are perceived as being the problem. And in fact, um, you know, everybody hates the, the banks because they created the, the economic crisis of 2008. Everybody hates the consumer goods industry because they are littering the ocean. Everybody hates the extractive industry because they are destroying the environment. And so they are, you know, they are very eager to associate themselves with human rights and with a better world because employees, consumers, and investors are putting pressure on them. And, you know, I have a joke that I repeat to people all the time. I say, you know how people in, in the Silicon Valley, they always invite a rapper to their birthday party because they are not cool? Well, in the same way, for the first time, the private sector wants social justice people to sit with them and give them guidance because they need to look good. And so that's in a way that, you know, you, it doesn't have to be a match made in heaven. It just has to work. Uh, and so, you know, but I agree with you. The, the private sector at the end of the game is interested in making money. But uh, but we probably have common objectives between social justice and, and those objectives of making money. And, and we can try to find a common ground. So there are some seats that are being offered at the table at these private companies, correct? Uh, and, and by seats, I mean actual practical seats, maybe even on the board or the executive team or C-suite leadership. No, no you know, people love to have uh, people love to have diverse uh, voice at the table as long as it's not a table where there is money and power. So, you know, if you look at the corporate board, it's extremely homogeneous. And frankly, the people that have the seats are fighting extremely hard to keep them. And... Um, you know, that's why actually the French, uh, you might have noticed I have a slight accent. I, I happen to be French. You know, the French did pass a law 10 years ago that required women on board. Uh, and it has been rather successful because, you know, now there is some level of parity on board in, in, in France. And, and that has now taken in, in most of Europe. But, but, the, but the conclusion there is that the regulator has to step in because, of course, boards don't self-diversify. Uh, and, and, you know, I would love to, to talk further about this. This is a huge initiative for me uh, to try to tell corporate boards, look, either you diversify or the, the, the consumers and the investors are going to, uh, to punish you and the regulator is going to uh, jump at your throat. Uh, but in the United States, it, it's a difficult uh, discussion. But that's a very good point, you know, is that as long as there is not the voices uh, that are representing marginalized community at the board, changes in corporations is going to be slow. How do you compare or what's the reason you place um, for the difference in, in, in the progress made in France, for example, in the United States? If I understood the reference correctly, has the United States perhaps failed or, or not kept at pace well, with know, France in your example? It's a bit changing. You know, Americans are, are, are strange people. They, they really believe in the invisible hand, even though the invisible hand has been betraying them for a really long time. But they are convinced that board will self-diversify. You just have to give them the opportunity and naturally they will uh, integrate women, they will integrate people of color, they will integrate LGBT people, disabled people. Um, you know, every report, every report shows you the contrary. Board are extremely homogeneous, and in fact, even the slates of candidates are homogeneous. Uh, I think the regulator is a bit fed up, and so there has been two pieces of legislation that have kind of rocked uh, rocked the boat. One is um, AB 979 in California that are, that is mandating two diverse board for uh, for every board, uh, diverse board member for every board. And then uh, another one is the NASDAQ listing rule, which requires a similar number of diverse uh, board members, although it's more of a 
comply or explain a uh, type situation. Um, but I think it has, you know, it has put on high alert boards and, um, and they are starting to think about it. Uh, it hasn't translated in huge demand. You know, I, I happen to run uh, a list of potential LGBTQ board members, you know, extremely talented people that have not been tapped because they live at the periphery of that, of that power center. Mm-hmm. And it has been, I haven't had, I haven't experienced a high demand, you know. Uh, I, I do have a few companies that have said, look, we would like to add LGBT profile to our board member. Um, but, but, you know, the invisible hand doesn't always work. And uh, the regulator sometimes has to step in uh, to kind of adjust a bit the balance. And, and that's something that is difficult to understand for uh, Americans who are a little bit ideological when it comes to capitalism. And in fact, there are a bunch of lawsuits against NASDAQ and AB 979 in which uh, groups of extremely conservative uh, uh, board members have said, um, this is unconstitutional, you cannot ask us to, uh, you cannot mandate us to introduce diversity on our boards. Uh, so, you know, we, you have to pay close attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think ultimately, and, and we'll discuss that later on, I think ultimately consumers and investors are playing a huge role, right? Because they are saying... How come it's just a bunch of straight white guys on your board, and yet you are claiming that you're standing for social justice and human rights? You know, it seems a bit contradictory. Makes sense. We'll talk a little bit more about my personal experience serving as an arbitrator and mediator. And there's a big push for diversity and practical steps the bar has taken to appoint judges. I mean, I come from New York City where there's a large South Asian population. I mean, one of the largest in the world outside of South Asia. And we've got maybe two judges in all of the circuit uh, that are South Asian background. I mean, that just yeah. doesn't add up. Uh, we'll and talk and you, see that, you see that in California, huge yeah. Latino population, no Latinos on corporate boards. Uh, very interesting. Thank you for your comments. We'll get back to you shortly. Our next speaker joins us from Chennai, India. Kirti Jayakumar is the founder of the Gender Security Project. Welcome, Kirti. And you've heard a little bit about uh, some of the troubles we've had here in the United States. How are things in India and from your perspective in that region of the world? Well, thank you, uh, Salman. Thank you, Fabrice, for your words. Um, Give me a lot to think about. Uh, So my background, I actually wear two hats. On the one hand, I am a feminist researcher working in the Women, Peace, Security Agenda and Feminist Foreign Policy. And on the other hand, I work with survivors of gender-based violence on ground as a liaison in helping them access resources when they face violence. So my understanding of global inequality and specifically over the past two years, as we've seen with the pandemic, is really that it is as old as the hills. Um, The pandemic literally blew the cover on these inequalities. It's fundamental to acknowledge that it didn't cause them as much as it's literally wrapped us in our knuckles to sit up and take notice. Um, What started out as a public health crisis soon sort of involved stories of domestic violence and gender-based violence across the world, regardless of where you were. People were forced to hole up in homes that were anything but safe for them, simply because lockdowns were considered appropriate policies across the world. India had a massive migrant crisis. People were forced to leave what they defined as their temporary homes to go back to places they lived with other members and their family. And several of them had to make this journey on foot. Now, if this isn't exposing inequalities that are so deeply rooted in our systems and our cultures, I don't know what is. Now, the current world order, whatever be it, whether that's industry, politics, media, or health, or education, rests on a discriminatory foundation, um, partly informed by colonialism and very heavily informed by the human tendency to divide and hold on to privilege, which comes at the cost of several other people's lives who live normalized forms of oppression. I am not as optimistic about the private sector as Fabrice is. Um, To me, the private sector looks like a world order where a Jeff Bezos can hire thousands of people around the world at less than minimum wage, but zip across the Earth's atmosphere into space on whim. Uh, For me, working through the inequalities is really just coming face to face with the system and the ways in which it privileges us 
and whether we're willing to actually give up some of that privilege, whether that looks like shining the spotlight on voices that are different from our own or ceding space or even taking a step back and doing nothing, if not doing anything beneficial. Um, to me, that looks like dismantling systemic and structural violence. Whenever you come up close and personal with it, is that for you looking like increasing the wage set for somebody who works for you? Is that looking at establishing a global compensation policy if you have a global team instead of just offering pay based on location because that's the way it's been done or is that looking at going beyond ad diversity and stir um fabrice talked about how companies have been called out on so many levels for not doing enough and as, as somebody who identified among all the groups he, he noted have hate politics against different sections i am i fully identify with the angle that he talked about um, my sense is that we have tried the quota. We've tried diversity, add diversity and stir, and it is not working. I think we've got to take a very, very hard look at ourselves and look towards making tables wider instead of fences higher. And whatever that looks like locally for you has to become a life uh, for this to change. I like that uh, tables wider, uh, but you know, it's not just a seat at the table and oftentimes we knock at the door, which isn't always opened. Uh, and I have learned and heard, well, you knock once, you knock twice, you knock three times politely. And if the door isn't open, just make your own building. Obviously it's not, it's easier said than done, uh, but I appreciate your comments and we're gonna just wrap it up and come back to you in a few minutes and just tie it all together. Uh, let me uh, introduce Nikhil Kumar, who is the deputy global editor at Grid News, which is based in Washington, DC. Nikhil, I think you're joining us from New Delhi. Uh, thank you for joining today. Welcome to the panel. Give us your thoughts on the topic. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm joining you from Delhi. Um, I So for the last uh, about a decade, I've been a foreign correspondent, just over a decade uh, in Europe, in the US, around South Asia. And my thoughts on this is someone who was paid uh, and is still paid to look at things and watch things as opposed to actually make the decisions, which makes it a lot easier, um, is that I think with a lot of this, uh, when we have conversations about diversity, about inequalities, one of the things that has struck me again and again is at the policy making end, whether it's governments, whether it's HR policies, quite often at the making of the policy level, a lot of this isn't factored in. And I thought what Keithy mentioned was, was really interesting because, you know, I was here, I was in Delhi um, when the, uh, the first COVID lockdowns were introduced. And the migrant crisis that took place uh, in this country, uh, which you spoke about, which was a huge thing. One of the most astonishing things about that crisis was that you didn't have to be, it seemed to me, and not just to me, but I think to a lot of other people who know this part of the world, you didn't have to be an expert on the economics of this country or the structure of this economy to know that it would happen. It was, it was you, know, it, you know, it didn't, it wasn't very... It wasn't something that was a surprise. It was something that was going to happen because of the way this economy has been constructed, right? Uh, cut to the United States. When, when, uh, when COVID first hit, some of the initial problems in New York City, for instance, about getting hold of PPE, about having enough people, uh, enough beds in hospitals, having enough supplies. This is, you know, depending on which metric you take, but essentially the wealthiest city in the wealthiest country in the world. Right. It's 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 because of the way the system was built. And I think with a lot of this, one of the things after COVID, which will be interesting to see, and I have to say, I'm not optimistic either about the public or the private sector when it comes to this. But then, you know, I'm a journalist, so I'm a cynic. But I, I, you know, is 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 acknowledging that that factoring in these all these uh, structural problems that need to be dealt with instead of just fixing um, you know, superficially that, okay, we will build, I don't know, extra capacity for PP and we'll just do that. Well, then, you know, you have to go further down the line to see how that gets distributed, where it comes from, et cetera, et cetera. Same with India, the, the post lockdown reality that we're living in right now, India had a devastating second wave last year. 
There is very little, interestingly, right now, conversation over here about what kind of post-COVID policy framework there should be that can address those structural issues. We've almost kind of moved on. We had the crisis. Mm. Now we're kind of talking about, you know, okay, how do we prioritize GDP growth? Where I agree entirely with Fabrice that I have seen almost zero evidence anywhere in the world that trickle down really works in any kind of sustainable way, right? And, and, and so that's the one point. The second thing that I just want to make, a uh, point I want to make is, is off something that Fabrice said, which I thought was really interesting about the importance of human rights. Again, over there, I think sometimes it's human rights is viewed quite often in the conversations in policy circles, but even in the media through a very narrow lens. And the example here that I'm kind of thinking about is, is, I mean, there's lots of examples from India, but a country where I reported from where recently we were doing things from because of the six month anniversary of the fall of Kabul, Afghanistan, where there's been this talk about human rights in the last few months uh, and, you know, and the new Taliban government and so on. But, you know, the right to food, which is being denied to a lot of people in that country, that's also a human right. You know, it all it's th- these rights are all that it's the picture is much broader, much more complex. And there are all kinds of structural issues that I just don't think sometimes are taken on board when we're sitting. I mean, forget about having conversations when we're just formulating policies. And hopefully, again, I'm not I'm not I don't think it'll happen, but I'm hoping I have my fingers crossed that post COVID, you know, there might be some kind of conversation and one, and I'll even give you, I just want to, uh, you know, just to end why I'm so pessimistic is because my first job in journalism was I used to cover the London stock market and uh, for a bunch of British papers. And then the financial crisis came. And I remember vividly when the crisis arrived um, that there was so much talk and you guys would remember about, you know, it was all of the papers from the financial pages, to the front pages, too big to fail, that we need to deal with too big to fail. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's been a decade and a half. There's quite a lot of too big to fail financial institutions in the world. It's not been dealt with. And, 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 and so that makes me very pessimistic. But then again, this is a crisis of a different order of magnitude. So maybe something will happen. But I think that's what needs to happen, that an acknowledgement that these are not an acknowledgement that looks beyond the symptoms um, and how they manifest to the structural issues, which, you know, which are actually not that hard to grasp. This is the other thing. Again, as a journalist, one of the things about a lot of this is it's not that complicated to grasp that, that we know. We know from so many examples in the corporate world. We know from examples in the media world, for instance, that if you have diverse newsrooms, you end up doing better work. That's just the way it works. We know all of this. We've known all of this for a long time. And yet somehow we fail to take it on board when we actually go out and implement policies. And, you know, Ukraine's playing right now and and the awful crisis there. One of the things that I'm sure, again, all of you would have seen is some of the coverage. I'm just going to talk about the media bit of it has been, I mean, well, has been, to be quite honest, terrible. Some of it, you know, in the way that it makes it seem that, you know, that there is something exceptional about this crisis simply because of the geography, uh, when, which, which in some ways almost minimizes even this crisis. Mm-hmm. Forget about minimizing all the other crises. It minimizes this as well. And, and a lot of that actually just has to come. I can say this as somebody who's, who's been in lots of newsrooms around the world. Diversity. It's just, you know, newsrooms where you have lots of different people from, with lots of experiences around the table you just end up with a better informed story or a better informed report. You just do because somebody will come and say, well, actually you misunderstood that and nobody will ever fully understand everything. But again, we don't always do it uh, in the ways that we should. And, and, and I'm continuing on, but I'll make one very, very quick point, which is we talked about boards earlier. Fabrice was talking about boards. One of the things that I've seen when it comes to the whole diversity issue, certainly in newsrooms is that something that I have seen over the last 15 years has been quite helpful is not just widening, you know, participation at the top, but actually making it really, really easy at the bottom to get in. Mm-hmm. Quite often, that's where the problem is, right? The, the you know, you need to have the big newsrooms are in the big cities, London, New York, wherever, or in India, you know, Delhi or wherever it is. And it's expensive to live in these cities. A lot of these internships don't pay. Right. If you live far away, you can't actually go. And even if you're qualified, you can't go and actually do that free two week stint or whatever it is. And so that means the editor or whatever will not see your face. And and fixing that 
has I've seen in my personal experience. I used to run CNN's bureau in across South Asia, and one of the rules we made, we I mean, we decided effectively is that we are not going to have anybody who is already pretty well qualified to go to other places around this city. The bureau was based in Delhi. Um, and and we'll prioritize people from elsewhere. And one big reason was was because we were one of the few places offering internships that paid. Uh, and I can tell you from my own experience that you know everybody went through you know the regular interview process and so on. And we had a whole bunch of interns over the many years that I was there. I'm I have said this again and again to many colleagues since all those people are going to be my boss and everybody else's bosses in the next few years. They're that good. But I also know that it it was a uh, you know, it was an uphill struggle almost because there's very few of those internships and those kinds of things around. So I think there has to also be a focus right at the bottom, not just at the top. Well, and, and if I may, Salman, if I, if I may interject yes, here, sure. you know, I love this comment because when I worked at the World Bank, you know, we were very attached to diversity, particularly making sure that there were people of color at the top of the institution, which was always an uphill battle. But what you would figure out after a while is that everybody came from the same socioeconomic background. They had been educated at the London School of Economics or they had been educated at Harvard, right? And, and they ended up being actually the sons of the intelligentsia of the countries in the global south that we wanted to represent. But in the end, nobody had ever had the experience of poverty or the experience of exclusion. And that led to a completely swapped thinking, you know? And I remember uh, Michel Camdessy, who was the head of the IMF, saying, you know, to uh, grow, for an economy to grow, people have to suffer. And that's only something that someone who had never suffered would say, right? Someone who has never experienced being hungry, you know, having to leave behind uh, uh, their house, um, not really sure they will be able to uh, provide for their family. And, and, you know, in a way, that was a little bit enraging when I was at the World Bank. And, and the, the cause is exactly what you described, which is that the internship were, were free. So you had to be able to get to Washington, D.C. and live for free in an incredibly expensive city. And then to get the internship, you had to be kind of connected to someone on the inside, and it perpetuated the same economic, socioeconomic background. And, and those issues sometimes are completely invisible to someone that has not been in the institution. You know, from the outside, it's like, well, anybody can come in that, is, that has the skills. But really, there is those invisible barriers uh, that exist. And I think, you know, in a way, that's the same thing in boardroom, is that a lot of the barriers are invisible. Nobody is going to say, I don't want a lesbian on the board. And actually, the people on the board tend to not be homophobic, but they don't feel comfortable and they don't trust gay people. And so there will be, when it's time to choose, they will choose people that are like them, they are comfortable with, and they are going to have a good time having dinner with. So I love, I just love your statement because it, it comes back to uh, something I have, I have witnessed before. Um. I, let's take the flip side of that. And I agree, and I'm on a number of access to education and access to internship and, 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 and professional development boards. So I hear you and I agree with you. Uh, the flip side of that perhaps is, is the diversity pool, whatever that diversity category is, already too small? And is it already very difficult to find um, qualified people within those pools? Right. Uh, and if that's the case, how do you resolve that? So to me, it's almost like I am interested in getting people on my board. But where do I look? I can't find anybody. And I don't want to say anybody. I'm sure I can find people if I look hard enough. Are there enough people for me to qualify them to join the board? Is it a access issue? Because oh, well, listen, the, the this is amazing because, because that's an argument I hear all the time, which is head of nominating and governance committee that say, you know, it's a supply problem. Right. There are only a few people of color that, mm -hmm. are, that have the skills and knowledge to get uh, to the boardroom. There is only a few Latinos that have the skill and knowledge. It's not true, right? There is association that have, you know, as Mitt Romney would say, that have binders and binders of women and Latino and people of South Asian descent that have the profile to be on the board. 
Uh, and then the other thing that you should know is that a lot of people that are on corporate boards are not really qualified. They just happen to be uh, people that are running in the right circle, that vacation in right. Martha's Vineyard and play golf, you know, at the PGA. I mean, you know, it's not, they would, you know, it, it's a bit lazy to say there is not the supply. And in fact, there's a huge infrastructure that is trying to present those diverse candidates to the board. I think, you know, it's more like, imagine if you are in a board in India, you know, and you are going to do a favor to one of your friends by bringing him on the board. Why would you pick a woman? How is she going to pay back? She probably doesn't have the cloud. She probably doesn't have the connection to give you the payback you're expecting. It's much better to tap someone that is in your circle and is going to pay you back in four or five years. And that's that's exactly... Um, what uh, what 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 Kirsi was uh, was describing, which is that there are mechanisms of reproduction of privilege, which is let's hang out in the same circle. We are going to help each other. We are going to make it to make sure that others are excluded, so our kids take our place in the next generation, and uh, and that's why it's not enough to hope that people are going to come to the realization that diversity is good. What we have to do is ensure that as employees, as consumers, as investors, we ask company to do better, uh, but also that the regulator steps in. I, I, um, I agree with Kirti's comment here. A lot of it is shining light, but then a lot of it may be giving up as well, right? Giving up this need to get compensated back or to have your back rubbed the same way you're up somebody else's back. But, Nicole, you have a comment? Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, I agree with everything Fabrice said. I was just going to, just a tiny point to add to it, was that I almost think that we need to widen our definitions when we are recruiting or, you know, trying to get people in of what counts as qualified, right? I think sometimes that in itself is quite limiting because the... I don't think, you know, I, I don't, I think it's probably said earlier that, you know, yes, nobody's going to say that don't have a lesbian or don't have a brown person or a black person on the board or whatever it is, right? Um, and, and I don't think people are necessarily out to do that, but it's just that the whole production line, so to speak, of people from beginning to getting to board or whatever job, that is colored by all kinds of things. And one of the things that I've certainly noticed over the years in my very limited experience is that if you just... You don't have to necessarily make a conscious effort to, I, I think you're right, that there may be instances where if you went and looked within whatever preset pool, you may not find the kind of person you're looking for if you're going to fill some diverse whatever. I almost think you need to forget about the pool because I think that you, when you step outside of the pool, it turns out that the person will not sound perhaps the way you expect them to sound. They might not immediately dress the way you expect them to dress, but it turns mm -hmm. out they can do the job just as well, sometimes much better than anybody from that pool. And, and, and I think that in itself is something that we just don't do enough. Just, just, you know, leave aside those, you know, preset definition of where we're looking. Because often that's where it comes down to, right? It's where are you looking when the recruiter goes out to recruit or when when you... One of the things, um, take, you know, we all read foreign news uh, from around the world. One of the things that often happens with foreign news is that, you know, a correspondent such as myself will fly into some country that I've been to before. And in a week is, you know, expected to say something intelligent about it. Now, you will rely, of course, on somebody who's already on the ground. Right. Turns out that that person on the ground in countries as varied as Afghanistan to Myanmar to Sri Lanka to wherever, they all pretty much look the same. Right. They are they are members of the local elite. Very often they are people who have come up through various networks of privilege who are there. Again, they're very competent, very good and very skilled at what they do but they're all the same. And so we all do the same thing. And then it just gets recycled again and again. And if you just stepped outside that for one second, right. Um, and, and you said, okay, fine, let's try somebody from elsewhere where it may be incumbent on the correspondent who's showing up for a few weeks to work a little bit harder. It actually does work better. It doesn't just, and that's the interesting thing, the point that I made to begin with. It's not so much, I'm not arguing for a second that we should all suddenly be altruistic in, in the way we go about this thing. It actually means you do better work because it turns out that 
if everybody else is doing that and you're doing something else, well, your work suddenly looks better, right? Mm. You've now got something much more interesting to say. Um, and, and that pays off. It pays off for the person who suddenly entered this so-called, you know, so to speak, bloodstream. And it pays off for you as well. I'd like to add to what Nick yes, said. Yes, please do. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I've noticed whenever I get into a room to have conversations around policy change, I'm almost often the only woman or one in two or three at the most. And that is a point of attrition. We're not looking at these as points of attrition. We're actually looking at them as checking boxes. We have women on board. We've represented them. Now, when you already have a limited space to compete for, the pools of resources are already so limited you want to be part of the system for the system to acknowledge you and bring you in. You don't want to be the piece that will dismantle the system because there's no way the system will welcome you into that fold. And so you have women who become purveyors of the patriarchy in positions of leadership. And, and then you have attributes that are thrown on these women, things like boss women. I mean, you have a whole merchandise line on that by capitalism. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But that's what it does. That's what it's self-serving. Now, for this panel, we have... Nikhil and myself are both from India, and Nikhil, forgive me if I'm outing you in any way with this, but I'm willing to bet he and I are both from the upper caste, dominant caste in the country. Um, there's a chance that we may have perspectives that you may have not heard, but then you may never hear perspectives from people from even more marginalized backgrounds, people from a lower caste community, people from a migrant community, people from the indigenous community in India. And, and in our rush, to really sort of fill a seat and to appear like we're engaging in diversity, we're still not going deeper. We're still looking at what looks like diversity. We're looking for the United Colors of Benetton. We're not looking for the people that are making those assembly lines possible behind. Um, we're, not, we're not willing to include those because they're not necessarily English speaking. They're not necessarily set up with stable internet. I need to tell you how I've actually showed up for today's conversation. I have six books piled on top of my bed because my desk collapsed. I am using my mobile internet. Now, these things are still not visible to you because I've had the privilege to pull this together to be available in this conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are still so many who just can't be. And how do we bring them into the fold? That's where we need to start thinking. Wow. Well, <laughs> on that, um, I, I was... Uh, not quite sure how I would leave this uh, panel and uh, I wasn't sure if you'd solve it all. Um, and while we haven't, I, I can make a, a promise here that this has been uh, one of the most engaging panels I've been involved in in the last four years of attending Horizons. I will pass that on to uh, our chairman and to the folks that put these panels together, including the comments that you just made, Kirti. Um, uh, because that is very important. I, I will not direct or, or, or reference any names, um, but uh, I will um, certainly um, communicate that uh, if you all would accept, we need to invite the three of you again to a much larger conversation on the topic. Uh, this was on point. Uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. We quite uh, didn't come up with... Um, with um, practical, actual sort of tangible solutions. But I, th I think we have something that may need to get baked a little bit more and perhaps involve a few other stakeholders and decision makers into this and enlarge the panel. So I thank all of you for joining today. Um, I welcome follow-ups and contacts and connections and staying in touch to continue this conversation. So thank you once again. And if there's any last words, let's do that now and we'll end the conversation for, for today. Yeah, I, you know, I think my, my last word will be to echo the, the comment from Nikhil. This is not altruism. You know, very often companies are approaching it as if they were uh, doing something philanthropic. This is not philanthropic. You are no, you're, you're doing nobody a, a favor. You're actually reflecting the real diversity of the world. And so to me, that, that's kind of maybe the last point is that working toward the quality on the board, working toward the quality in the workforce is not doing anybody a favor, is reflecting uh, the diversity of the world. Um, and and uh, that will be my last one. Okay. Thank you all. And just stay on. I'm going to stop the streaming and we'll connect in just 10 seconds.